Welcome to the Effortless Swimming Podcast. My guest today is Tim Reed. Tim, you're very experienced, very successful triathlete and also very experienced and successful coach as well. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Bren. Yeah, it's cool to be on. Um, I owe you, first of all, a big thanks for making my coaching life easier because whenever I'm trying to explain <laughs> something to someone, you know, an aspect of their swim stroke or anything, I just go, oh, Brent, I'll have a video on this and quickly find it, show them <laughs> that, and then saves my, save myself a lot of time. So, no, it's cool to finally connect. Yeah, it's been great to connect. We've got a mutual friend uh, in, in Dudley who um, who introduced us. And, I mean, I've seen your name around for, for years just in the in the results of a lot of the half Ironman, um, full, full distance as well? You're doing... I did, yeah, I wasn't as successful over the full distance but um, and raced it a lot more sporadically. But, yeah, I had a few results over the Ironman distance and a lot of bad results as well. <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, I guess the biggest – Success for you was probably 2016 winning Ironman, so like 70.3 world champs, which is which is unreal. Would you classify that as your, your biggest success in, in racing? Uh, I've always – I'm pretty objective about things. So, like, I look at the numbers more than the results. And I actually had better – in my mind, I had better results in 2015 and in 2019, actually, when I look objectively at the data. Um, in terms of, yeah, winning races, 2016 was, was definitely the best year. Um, but I take more pride in the numbers where the day, the, uh, years where I was like, the numbers were better than any other year sort of thing. So, um, and by numbers, are you talking times? Are you talking like, yeah, what, how, so what? looking at, looking at in the swim, it's a bit more subjective, but looking how I was able to stay with the main group or if I wasn't able to stay with the group, the main group, how I was able to get back into the race, uh, looking at power numbers and then run, run time is pretty, um, you know, pretty objective because there's not a lot changes there. Although now with the new fancy shoes, things are changing pretty quick. But um, yeah, so just just looking at times and my power output and things like that, and also even my headspace a little bit, how how I raced and and was able to keep a cool head um, was definitely is definitely part of what I would consider you know contributes and uh, to the success of how I value a race. Is that something you feel has improved over? time or you've had years where it's been good years where it hasn't been so good in terms of keeping a cool head and the, the mental aspect of it yeah so i i reckon 2015 i was physically probably at my best but my head was on and off and and i think you know i went into 70.3 world champs that year ranked number one and i just was hopeless because i hadn't slept for three nights and i was i put all this pressure on myself and couldn't get my head under control um i got better at it and i think it really helped up until about in 2016 when I won world champs over that distance. And then I think my head went again. Suddenly I felt all this pressure being the world champ, you know. So it wasn't a linear, like it was definitely not linear in, in terms of gaining control of my mental um, aspects of racing. Uh, it comes and goes. And when I put the work in, I, th I think like most people, and it's really cliche, but when you do the mindfulness work, when you do the meditation, when you do the visualizations, yeah, it pays off and you, and you can, your head's in the right space during races. But I was also really good at skipping all that stuff and then wondering why I couldn't get my head under control. Yeah. Well, it, uh, you, you've been up you know, in the top ranks for, for a very long, long time. What do you attribute that to? Um. I think largely, I think time in the sport and also just time doing lots of different sports. I mean, everyone, you know, sometimes views an athlete that's suddenly getting results and they're like, wow, he's sort of come from nowhere and um, he's just kicking ass off, off seemingly no history in the sport. But I just have never found an athlete in endurance sports who comes from nowhere. Like they've either got a, like I had a history in playing team sports, but I was playing four or five hours a day you know, growing up, even though I didn't have a history in swimming, biking or running. Um, and then even then it's still, I spent a lot of the time racing as an amateur before I even turned pro. There was no overnight success, even those people outside looking in, I thought, oh, that's a really fast rise to the top. And and you see the same with everyone else. I think there's just, there's, it just takes decades really to build up the, the aerobic pathways to be good at endurance sports and a lot of that, I think, is due down comes down to an addictive personality and perhaps an inability to sit still, and you know a lot of mental aspects that drive you out the door to train a lot. And and of course, there's genetic aspects too. Um, you, 
it would be hard even if you did all the right things if you don't have a certain level of talent i think it's going to be tough to make it to the to the top because you coach a lot of other pros and what do you th- what do you think attracts other pros to to you as, as a coach and where have you learnt some of the the lessons that maybe these other pros are just just starting to take on board or you know just starting to uncover for them for themselves um that's a good question i think uh there's a lot to be said for having been through all the experiences or similar experiences to what they're going through understanding if that athlete is particularly anxious about racing saying the right things leading into a race um the psychology of of working with an athlete is super important that i think a, a lot of brilliant sports scientists might not understand if they haven't been through the stress of racing or if you know vice versa with an athlete who's super cruisy you know you've got to tell them a completely different thing to the the really anxious athlete um i so i, I think that potentially my ability to understand people and connect with athletes probably i think that's probably a strength of my coaching um you know i think this the science behind endurance sports coaching is not overly complicated but knowing um getting working out the psychology of what will really motivate an athlete what will what they need to be told or what they need to um to not be told sometimes is is really important and and that's i think that's the really hard part of coaching is understanding that it's it's human to human it's it's understanding personalities it's uh saying the right thing at the right time or shutting up when you need to <laughs> mm. that's uh because what what sort of fascinates me there is you seem very uh, driven by by the science and you're well well adept in what you need to be doing to to have success in the sport but it's only if the person's able to take that on board and have that belief that it's going to to work for them and and actually do it that will make the difference whether or not they have su- success with it so like you sort of mentioned it's it's great to have the, the sports science there but if they can't relay it to the athlete in a way that they're either going to take it on board or that they can actually have an, an outcome from it or they have right well this is the next step for me then it's it's it, it's useless and someone who i've learned a lot from in terms of the coaching is the guy wayne goldsmith who i've had on the podcast a couple of times and what he talks about is the the art of coaching it's not it's not the workouts like anyone can write the same workout but it's how you apply it it's how you get your athlete to uh, to do it make sure they stick to the right training zones or you know you're able to to explain it to them so there's so much outside of the scientific aspect of coaching that is often not talked about but that's really where i think the the magic is and someone who i've i haven't seen really in, in person but from what i can tell and you know, someone like dean boxel who coaches Ariane Titmus, uh, I know one of uh, his other ath- athletes uh, reasonably well, and just it sounds like that's his personality that and the way it. that he runs. Sorry, mate, I just had you freeze for a bit. What was that? You got up to who coaches? Was it Ariane? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Dean Dean Boxel, who yeah. coaches Ariane Titmus. Yeah. She um, uh, like the having a, a coach who can build a culture or who can you know relate to his athletes. That's where I think the, the the magic really is, and if you can tie those two together with the sports science and then the the art of coaching, that's a, a powerful combination. Yeah, I totally agree. I've, I've um, you know, some of the coaches I had through my career, you know, were some of the best sports scientists. I still think that that just impressed me um, incredibly with their level of knowledge and their expert expertise. And in many ways, I I didn't always do what they said, or I didn't do enough testing when they wanted it to. I, I was sort of the problem in the relationship, but because they uh, they hadn't got me on board completely, there was not the, the trust built up, you know. And then I had other coaches where the sports science knowledge was definitely not as not as at the same level as those coaches. But I was fully on board because they they'd uh, I guess connected with me as a person. Um, they explained the importance of what they're doing. There was good reasoning behind it. So even though they were the, yeah in, in some ways i had you know some of my best racing with i think one of the best sports psych, psychologists in the sport but not necessarily the best sports scientist uh so yeah there's the strengths and weaknesses to to every coach but i think if you can start to get that balance right between 
knowing as much as you can in terms of the science, but being able to really get the athlete on board, that's, that's where the magic really does happen. Mm. Uh, and I think a big part of that is also either telling stories or using examples and showing people why and how it can work. And an example of that is I think of the, the Norwegians at the moment, right? So everyone sort of you know, sees, sees those guys having good success and they've come out of nowhere, so to speak, but they've been building for a very long, long time. But it's really, I think, brought a lot more attention to and awareness around the sports science, but in a way where it's a bit easier to understand because you've got that example there of like your, your sort of zone two training and what is it, high, high volume um, at, at the right intensity. And and to me as well, like that sort of helped me understand the importance of the right training zones. Whereas before I've just looked at it and gone, ah, it's all too hard. Or yeah, I haven't quite got that, that example or, or way to be able to relate the, the data. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's a really helpful way for, for showing people uh, what they what they need to be doing as well, having those examples or, or stories. And um, yeah, to me, that's been quite, quite useful. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's funny because what the Norwegians are doing is is not revolutionary stuff. It's just that I think we sort of, in many ways, we moved away from it. The, the general the general move was, was just trying to find quicker, easier, faster solutions. But, you know, the reality is the long-term approach of, um, of the basics that have been around for a long time really pays off. And they, even though they use a lot of tricky devices and things to measure everything, the actual principles behind what they're doing is very basic and, mm. and it works. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, that, that's exactly right. But it's, it, it's really opened my eyes to, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's made me interested in learning more about it as well. Yeah. Um, cause I had, I had good stuff on the, the podcast just after his Kona, after his Kona win. And um, so I sort of, I, was, I wanted to research you know, well for the podcast and make sure I uh, you know, had good questions to ask and all that sort of stuff. And it, um, then I sort of went down the rabbit hole on, on all of it and um, yeah, and found it quite, quite interesting. It, for the pros that you're working with or have, have worked with, I, I read that in terms of the, the swimming, you've had them either pull back from squad and do their own training or, or move down the lane. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, so it does depend on the athlete for, to some degree. I think there's some that some of my pros who, who are really just are not even at that point where they can throw big volume at their swimming yet because their technique's just not good enough. Like they've got too much to work on. Sometimes I'm like, if you can get someone to look at you while you're swimming and just be giving feedback, then that's, the, that's what we're really focusing on now before we even think about really getting a lot fitter. Um, but the more advanced pros who are just um, – some of them for triathlon too, it's really hard if you jump in with a swim squad and they don't have any idea around what your other hard sessions are in the week and they're not working in with that. Um, like it's, it becomes, you just can end up spending way too much time at or above anaerobic threshold and the stress of like, it can become very stressful on the athlete. Uh, and Real, realistically for Ironman, for example, the, the goal is to get through that swim, not necessarily winning the swim. It's just to be in the mix and get through it with as low a lactate level as possible. And so, you know, for example, Steve McKenna, who just had got, um, second at Bustleton, uh, Ironman Western Australia, we, we real, he, he had great anaerobic capacity. Like he could swim so much faster than me over a hundred meters, 200 meters, but once you started getting to 400 to 600, our times start to even out. And I was, after years and years of not liking swimming that hard, I'd actually developed a really good aerobic capacity and could just hold my 100 metre pace really well without generating tonnes of lactate, whereas he was very much the opposite in that he could put 10 seconds into me over 200 metres, but it would start to come back. And so, yeah, guys like Steve, I had to um, really work on pulling back from squad because he would just jump in there and just rip, you know, 105, 100s when really what he needed to be doing was learning to swim 115s at, you know, hope, ideally like well under two millimolar lactate. So um, we just did, yeah, almost went um, to the real old school methods of just bulk miles, but at quite aerobic intensities. Um, and we still worked 
quite a range within that zone two. Like it's it's very easy for people to just throw out that zone two terminology, but it's a huge range, especially for really fit athletes. Um, it's quite a range of pace in, in the pool for some guys, whether they're going really easy zone two or almost zone one. And then, you know, going up to that, to that point where they're still, they're starting to generate lactate, but it's being cleared pretty well as well. So, um, I, I, yeah, I, it, for most, um, age group and elite triathletes, I sort of recommend potentially one to two hard swim squads a week. If the, if it's available to them, especially if they're, at that point with their technique where they can really just push their, their fitness. And then the rest of it, I'm like, you can't get in, you know, two hard bike sessions or in a hard run session as well as four hard swim sessions. It's just, it's just too much stress on a, on a, um, triathlete. So it's about matching what you do on the bike and on the run, you do one or two hard sessions and the rest you keep really quite aerobic and easy. And when you were explaining to Steve about the, this is what we, I think we need to, to do. Was that by him pretty, pretty immediate? How did you go about showing him where the, where the gap was? I think by having the data for him to see and, and having his own lactate monitor and things like that, I know everyone thinks it's a bit gimmicky and everyone's jumping on the bandwagon, but I've always found if people can, if athletes can actually see for themselves that it's not something I'm just, it's not a hypothesis of mine. It's, it's there. The numbers are there. You know, the same way I'll say to someone, I don't think you're an efficient fat burner. I think we need to do a little block working on becoming more metabolically efficient. They don't really get on board with that unless they go and do a metabolic test and then mm. they're shown, oh, shivers, I can't ride 70% of FTP without burning tons of glycogen. You know, like when they see the data, I find they jump on board a lot quicker. So, mm. um, and Steve's a bit like me, like uh, as an athlete, which is why I think I've been quite patient with him is he loves to smash himself in training and doesn't want to necessarily, it, it is hard to get him to get on board with some of these ideas, but he's also, he's also pretty intelligent. So when he sees that the, sees the data or the numbers on the test, he's like, oh yeah, okay. I got to listen now and give it a try. So yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I find it similar in a way as having the, the evidence there or having the data as when someone gets filmed, they yeah. might've had a coach telling them uh, crossing over. And they're like, yeah, okay, okay. Then you show them and they're like, far out. That's like, this is this doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. Having that evidence there that you can't refute actually helps with the with the buy-in and then and then taking things on board. And for for a lot of people, they haven't been filmed before. And it's just such an eye opener for them. And it's I think it's really the first step for many people to actually start making a change to your to their technique because you just don't know what you're doing otherwise. Like it's I, yeah, when I, even today, when I look at my stroke, I haven't been filmed for a little while, but yeah, that first time I got filmed, I was thinking, Jesus Christ, I, all right, I better, I better work on my own stroke before I start to tell other people how to, how to swim. <laughs> yeah. No, I think especially with swimming, I had, a, I literally had this conversation with an athlete, um, this morning who'd sent me a video and he was like, I thought I was a good swimmer. Then I saw the video. He was all depressed. Um, <laughs> your level of proprioception and awareness of where you are in water is so different to land. Like I think most people, if I give them a technique correction on the run or even on the bike and be like, Hey, I need you to relax and do this. They just do it. But in the swim, they can't fix it until they can see that they haven't actually fixed it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Swimming, swimming so weird like that. It's just, it's, um, it's almost like hearing your own voice on a podcast. You're like, Ooh, do I really sound like that? Like, you look at your own stroke and you're like, ooh, that's not pretty. <laughs> yeah, so so true. But the, the thing about swimming too is that even even some very good swimmers, particularly triathletes who are you know, some fast swimmers, they don't look that good necessarily either. So it's not like we need to look good for the sake of you know looking pretty. There's no points to that. It's it's really about about the speed. But obviously, there's so much that we can see in video that. Yeah, we know it's going to help make someone faster either by reducing drag or, or increasing propulsion, but it doesn't need to look, look pretty. So I'm, I'm always trying to make that clear for people, especially triathletes is there's no points for, for looking pretty. The chain, the things that we're looking at are just to help you get, get faster and not just look better because sometimes people try it. They fall into that trap of trying to have this smooth, pretty stroke and, you know, have it look like a, stroke that they've seen on Instagram and go, okay, that's how I, I need to swim. And actually an example of that is 
like Dan Smith, who I don't know if you've seen that video on our YouTube of um, Dan Smith from the 2016 Olympics. We recorded some footage of him and he, he does a 110 and it looks like he's swimming two minute pace, but a beautiful swimmer. But for most people, they shouldn't try and swim like him because he's just got this incredible innate feel for the water. He's swum since he was a kid, done thousands and thousands of hours, and he's got incredible mobility as well. So for most people to swim like him, it's just not its not the stroke that they should be going for. And there's been some swimmers who have tried to adapt their stroke to look like him. And I've just said, go, hang on a second. No, we've got to change it. You, you should look, try and aim to swim like this person instead. Yeah, that's, that's a really that, – that's I wasn't sure how much you touched on this before, but it was something I thought I should bring up. But I was uh, – when I first – first year or two I was racing pro, I was swimming faster in the pool than I ever did later in my career and I could not make the front pack and uh, I was trying to swim like a swimmer. And uh, I actually got so frustrated with it, I went to LA and started training, did a block of training with Jerry Rodriguez over there. And um, the first thing he did when he saw me swimming, he's like, you've got to stop trying to swim like Ian Thorpe. You're not flexible enough. You don't have the feel for the water. What you have is a high VO2 max. So you just need to get your stroke rate from 65 to 75. And I think you'll start making the pack. <laughs> and that's literally what we worked on. I just, just rated up. It looked a lot more messy, but especially when you're in the, the bubbles of the people's feet in front of you, mm. um, I didn't didn't have that range of motion anyway to get a really nice catch at the front. So by t getting that faster turnover, I was getting an extra 10 strokes per minute and I wasn't falling off the back of the pack anymore. And I left that six week block in LA and every race for the rest, rest of the year, instead of getting out two minutes behind the pack, I was riding, I was riding the race from the start. And, uh, hmm. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, pro you might be able to speak more on this than me, but I feel like for open water swimming, especially on feet, the, how pretty it needs to look is secondary to the just the basic physics of pushing yeah. water behind you. <laughs> so yeah, so so true. And actually, I yeah, I, I sort of went through a similar thing where my background was was competitive swimming in the pool, and then I started. When did I start tries? I think I started tries in 2015, but I, I sort of started doing open water swimming from about 2008, and the evolution from say. 2008 where I was a pool swimmer over the next eight years or so it just my stroke started to get scrappier and scrappier and but I was swimming really well in the open water and I had some really good swims in the few triathlons that I did and you know, open water races I was going well but then I, I'd also do this one one pool race every every year it was Victorian country champs and I had a, had a friend who's a very good pool swimmer uh, he was on the Olympic team and he coaches a lot of a lot of good swimmers and he saw me swim the 400 freestyle and he goes that looks hideous that looks your stroke looks so bad and i'm like i'm thinking like all right that's a kick in the guts but you're you're right it looks like an open water stroke and it just it wasn't pretty in it it wasn't that quick either in the pool but it was so good for open water and i found it hard to sort of have those have those two because i've just gotten so used to swimming for the the open water but yeah it did not look good <laughs> it wasn't that quick in the pool even if um, people aren't on feet, I'm interested, why is it that for you, in your opinion, why is it that that scrappier stroke seems to work pretty well? Like, I, is it because of the, the chop and the currents and the, or is it the higher buoyancy of salt water or? Well, I think my, all my races, I'd say, were with a, a wetsuit on. So, you've, yeah, you've got that, that buoyancy and then obviously the, the salt water as well, where you're just better off having that faster stroke rate because um, you're just sitting so high in the water that you can sort of get the, the stroke rate up and you need to get to come over quickly. You can't do it with this Ian Thorpe like recovery. You just better swing that hand over the top, getting it in. So yeah. I think that's partly where that scrappiness comes and from. It's fatiguing to just even in a wetsuit to, to yeah. have that neoprene around your elbow to then do that high elbow catch. I find it, a lot of our um, athletes, we really go, you know, go for almost a straight home recovery or just a relaxed, whatever feels natural recovery in your wetsuit. And if you want to go high elbow and pretty in the pool, that's fine without one, but it's just too hard in, in a wetsuit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, yeah, pretty much with the wetsuit on, as long as you're not swinging really low and flat over the water where it's causing this sort of, you know, side to side movement, um, 
it doesn't matter too much how you're coming over as long as um yeah as long as you're not too low low and flat there so it's man it's something i had to learn as a as a coach uh, originally coaching pool swimmers to then coaching triathletes and open water swimmers um and i think and i see a lot of coaches going through the same thing that i went through coming from a, a pool background where there's a lot more emphasis on looking good being smooth all that sort of stuff but yeah, you've just got to have some other allowances there for for the triathletes and that's such an interesting story about you going to see see jerry there and i actually had uh, dan atkins on the podcast who coached a lot of the itu guys uh guys and girls in australia and he had michael bowl next to him who's probably the best australian swim coach at the moment and bowley said to him that you know, with these athletes like they haven't got the range of motion the technique is okay but they're not going to be swimming like like swimmers. So just get them as get them as fit as you can to to swim, you know, as they need to swim. Don't yeah, don't worry about trying to perfect everything with their stroke. Just get them as fit in the pool as, as they can, and that's what's going to help them be really yeah. you know, really good ITU swimmers. I often wonder too, like whether um, the cycling and the, maybe the running to a degree, but especially the cycling you start to get really flexible from the swimming, but then there's a limit to how flexible you'll get and your range of motion because of all that cycling that will limit a, a triathlete from ever getting that same range as a swimmer. Because I could, you know, you're just locked into this position potentially for 12, 15 hours a week on a bike or that position. Um, I wonder if that, I, I don't know, but I wonder how much that affects the ability to develop the sort of range of, of a swimmer or is it just the fact that a swimmer you know triathletes are never going to be doing you know 40k a week of swimming you know like a, a swimmer yeah. is to get that range so that's you know, i noticed that when i did um so i did one season of i, I built up and did a, an iron man and i found found that in that year i my swimming really changed and i just noticed my overhead range was was a fair bit less. I can't remember the exact numbers, but you've got the combined elevation test where you can lie face down, uh, chin on the floor, link your thumbs together and you have your arms above your head and you see how how high you can get it. I think I went from being at, at 20 degrees off the ground to like seven or eight degrees. Like it Big change. reduced, yeah. it reduced a lot. And you, it, was, it was really just uh, from the cycling primarily, but also the running, like just, just this movement, you know, I tend to be a little bit more, more hunched there, but yeah, my, my range of motion reduced a lot. And I also found that the my legs were a bit, not, I don't know, maybe not necessarily heavier, but just but use your legs a lot more. You've got they denser, have, denser would, muscles. Yeah, though, when you consider the muscle density to cycle and run through, like it would have to change the whole body, you know, the whole weight of your, where your body weight's distributed. So, yeah. yeah. So I noticed that because I went from never doing a bit of running, but definitely no cycling. Um, yeah, that was that was one of the biggest changes. So I think that yeah, it just lends itself to those changes to, that you that you need to make for the open water swimming rather yeah. than the, the pool swimming. And if, so for you, um, when you're working with your your athletes, are you are they sending you videos regularly and you're giving them one or two things? How yeah, does that so usually with the work? Online guys, you know, we have a local squad too, but the uh, online guys, I encourage basically whenever they're with someone, just grab a quick video. Um, underwater, obviously ideal overhead if, if not, and you can, and I, I always try and work on just one thing at a time. Um, I, maybe because I'm a bit simple, but I found it really hard to correct more than one thing at a time in the, in the water. And I mm -hmm. sort of stuck with that with my athletes. So we'll work on one thing until I see the next video, then we'll work on one other thing if that that's corrected. Um, yeah, so that's, that's basically how we do it. And we obviously try and run camps pretty regularly because sometimes Nothing, nothing replaces face-to-face -face coaching, in my opinion. I mean, online's the reality for most people, but um, when you can spend time with an athlete, it's it's so useful to pick up. I can just make a note within about ten minutes of watching them. Okay, and these are ten things we'll work on in the next three months. You know, so um, yeah. So that's typically how we do it with the the video work. There's sort of no limit to how many our clients can send through if they're sort of on board with a coach it's they're fully on board and we're, we're fully invested in them yeah i find there's a difference too when some talk about being at a, a camp and, and seeing someone you know, maybe swim a session someone might can look good for 100 meters but maybe they can't look good for for a full session and you really get to see what their 
what they're actually swimming like. So what I try and make sure that they do is just, unless they're trying to make a change and we want to see, all right, how, how does it look when you're doing that? Just swim like no one is watching you because that's the technique that you've got ingrained. So we want to, we just want to see what's actually there, not when you're trying to, to look pretty for the, for the camera as yeah, well. That's a good point. On our last camp in Bright, we got everyone to do a 600 meter, or maybe it was 400 meter, just 600 meters at Ironman pace. And we didn't necessarily tell them, but we filmed everyone's last hundred meters just so that we could really find what was, because you're right, as soon as people know there's a camera there, then suddenly Ian Thorpe magically appears. <laughs> <laughs> or, or sometimes it's the opposite too, because they're okay. nervous about getting filmed. So they're really just like, they're like a robot when they swim. They yeah. lose that rhythm and, uh, and fluency to their stroke. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's good to film them when they're, when they're not looking. Is there been, um, uh, like for the, say, age group athletes that you're, you're coaching, in terms of their swimming, is there a couple of things that have come up on, on quite a regular basis where you've got, say, three or four main problems they might be having or technique issues, and then you've got like a prescription for them? Is there anything that comes to mind when you think of that? Um, it's Yeah, I guess... Um... I find the, the biggest thing we, we tend to work on is the difference in technique for people getting into a wetsuit. Most of our amateur athletes tend to be in wetsuit legal swim, especially if they're a bit nervous about the swim. And uh, we find, you know, like a lot of the things they've learned in the pool, like, for example, even the head position is slightly different so they can keep the, some of those wetsuits just almost lift their legs out of the water. And um, so like what we talked about with the, the different recovery, um, slightly different head position to for some people who like to kick a bit or get some generate still generate some speed out of their kick uh, i think also people can end up really arching their back in open water with a with a um with the buoyancy of the wetsuit and salt water so we try and you know remind people that if you want to get out of the if you don't want to be like have lower back issues the first 30k of the, the ride it's really important to still keep your core slightly activated or and or just in a a more neutral alignment to the spine, which you, you don't have to think about the same way when you're in a when you're in a pool in fresh water. Um, maybe it should be, but people tend to be not at, not in such a um, damaging position. Um, and then we work. My group work a lot on open water skills, so we spend half you know a lot of half of our main set actually sitting on feet in the pool. Um, because the reality is most of us are going to be sucking feet. <laughs> and so it's important to just learn how to do that. I, I was always a pretty terrible swimmer relative to how I got out in races, but I think I developed, I was lucky to have lots and lots of group swims, open water and in the pool where I could just practice being in the draft of other swimmers. And it became so instinctive to me. I was never, I never had to really look up because if I did, I'd normally get dropped, but I would just be, I could feel when I was in the bubbles of someone, I could feel when it, if, when it suddenly they were half a metre in front of me and I just quickly lifted up for four, six strokes to get back into the draft. So a lot of my, our athletes, um, particularly the amateurs, is just learning how to be comfortable in the draft, learning the differences in open water technique um, and learning, yeah, because you could, you know, as we know, if, if you can get really good at, at just sitting on, Sitting on people, it's a much easier way to get through the swim, um, mm. unfortunately, for the good swimmers. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about that too is it's, it's counterintuitive in a way because when you're sitting on feet, you don't get much of a catch. You yeah. feel like you're swimming worse in a way, aside from being pulled along, but you feel like you're swimming worse because there's just there's very little pressure on the hand through that first part of the the catch. And so I like in training, I hate being second. I always want to lead the lane because I just like the, the feel of the water and to me, that's that's comfortable, but I know when it comes to racing, obviously right, I've got to got to sit on on feet, but it doesn't it just doesn't feel good. So just knowing that that's the right thing to be doing first of all, and you can save up to about thirty percent of your energy if you're drafting well. It's just so worth worth doing. And then we had a Peter to pub, which is probably the biggest race here in Victoria. There's about four or five thousand competitors, and I just did the age group swim, and another guy, Sam Shepherd, who he's a really good swimmer. He's, he's won that event overall seven times, but he had a baby six weeks prior to the event. So he's lacking sleep, lacking fitness. And I'm thinking this is the, my one chance to beat him mm -hmm. uh, because he hasn't, hasn't been able to train, but it, 
long story short, he got me by about two seconds, but his open water skills are just so good from being, you know, competing at, at, at a very high level for a long time. And I was sitting on his feet for 300 meters and he's like, oh, hang on a second. I, I haven't got the fitness here. I'm just, so he just quickly darted off to the side about five meters. So I went with him for a bit and I'm like, oh, I don't like this line he's taking. So I just sort of went on my own, but he knew that that was a bad move for him to make if he was, if I was on his feet, because I just, I was, wasn't working very hard. And then he just got me with the open water skills at the end, caught a wave before me and so on. So those open water skills just make such a, such a difference. And it takes, takes, I think a couple of years to really get good at them, but uh, boy, you can make your swimming easier uh, if you, if you learn them and you can do them well. Yeah, it's really, it's, um, it's the hardest thing for athletes who are a bit isolated for group sessions in that regard. Like uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very, it's very like, I, I think I got good at it because I had the, I had Grant Giles running Aeromax up here and we would every week would be bashing each other as we went, swam around some boys, you know? So that was just part of the weekly process. And, and not only do you get that instinct for knowing when you're on feet, when to rate up without having to constantly be looking up to find, find where everyone is, um, you just get really comfortable with being that claustrophobia of, um, of the chaos of a swim, you know, I mean, now they do wave starts, but back in the olden days, we was, it was always mass starts and, and pretty, pretty daunting if you're not really good at it. But even with the wave starts now that the amateur athletes do, I think there's so much value in them having continuously been made slightly uncomfortable in the open water and not, not wasting energy with stress and anxiety and, uh, you know, just, just over like you know what it's like in at the start of the swim so, so many people are just if they're swimming tense and just really stressed out that first two or three hundred meters they're completely completely full of lactic acid without you know without really getting any benefit out of that much stress and effort so mm. um I, I find the, the big part of continually getting people to be surrounded by other swimmers and even in the pool we finished most sessions with that basic you know four across the lane straight arm recovery just 25 meter sprints, just to get used to just people being in your, in your grill, in your space. So, um, yeah, there's a lot to be said just for being, com being comfortable with that, that close, um, yeah, that feeling of people being really all over you. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think you can get to that point too, where it, that actually becomes fun and enjoyable being in a, in a tight group and, you know, making sure you're aware of where everyone is and thinking about strategy. Like if you're in the very, very middle, it might be okay, but you don't want to be able, you don't want to sort of get, get caught behind or um, not able to sort of make a break. If you're, if you're stuck in the very middle like that, that strategy being in the thick of things can become quite enjoyable. So for anyone who's a, who's a beginner or learning these skills, I think change, like changing the mindset around it too. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be uncomfortable in the beginning there's it's, it's going to be challenging but you can actually turn it around where it becomes the the fun part in a way um and and same with uh, you know, i guess some of the other aspects of triathlon too where it's it's hard work it's a lot of a lot of training but i think the people who do it more and get really good get really fit that's the thing that they seek out the most is that that intensity and is that is that hard training and then when you go away from it you you miss it. Whereas someone who's a couch potato and is looking at that going, Oh, that's, that's not fine. That's not something I want to want to be doing. So I think it can be, can be reversed in a way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's even, you know, for me now, um, who hated that experience of, you know, of being the, the, that feeling of almost, you know, getting drowned by everyone. All I want to do now, if it comes to swimming is jump in an open water race. Cause for me, that <laughs> I love the tactics. It's like a bike race in that, you're in draft, you're in groups, you're getting boxed in, you know, it's about surges. It's about hitting a, hitting a boy turn. Well, that's the, that's the funnest. So that's the most fun part of um, swimming for me now. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I even jumped into some open water races recently with very little fitness, but it was, it was fun. I loved it. And you're right. Like that, it can turn from being the most scary part of a triathlon to actually being the most fun part. Yeah. And you mentioned, so you're, you're now going through that transition of being a well, full-time athlete. You've always, always sort of coached, but now it's, it's transitioning to more of a full-time coach, but still uh, doing some races here and there, whether they're triathlon or, or some other, other sports. You, you mentioned that prior to the call that you 
asked a lot of people, you did some research around that transition because like any professional athlete, it can be a, a really big one and a very challenging one. So what were some of the concerns that you had making that transition and what was some advice or who were some people who helped you with, with it? Yeah, it's funny. It was something I was really interested in for quite a while and I was asking a lot of um, either recently or long-time retired pros about how did they go with the transition and without, like nearly everyone struggled with it. And I thought, oh, I'm pretty pretty prepared for this because I never really stopped, you know, dipping my hand into coaching or, um, you know, and even before being a professional triathlete, I didn't come from a high-performance program. So I was always working. Um, and when I was racing pro, I was balancing my wife's work as well and kids. And But yet I still really struggled with the, the transition from oh, I'm a full-time coach now, you know, and, and I guess – you, you get really good as a pro athlete at, at always putting yourself first. And it's hard to suddenly step back and, and actually become a bit more selfless, um, learning to, oh, I'll fit my training in if I get all my other work done. Oh, I didn't get everything done for everything else. Therefore, I'll shorten my session by two thirds or whatever it is. So it was, that, that transition was hard. And I think um, the other thing I found hard was I thought when I, I was really burnt out at the end of 2021, racing like really racing poorly and just cooked from travel training, all the stress of losing sponsors through COVID. And, and I thought I'm never doing anything with triathlon again. And I took like six weeks off thinking I'd be so productive in the rest of my life. And um, what I actually found was the opposite. You know, I found how much my brain and my body just needed to move every day to feel good. And then everything else seemed to flow well from that. And, Certainly for me, there's, there's a tipping point, you know, beyond about, you know, ha I find half of what I used to do as a full-time pro athlete, a really nice level for me to stay balanced in my life and still enjoy training and also keep learning, like keep relating to athletes, remembering what the sessions feel like, um, continually learning. Cause I still do lots of little experiments with myself now with training and, and trying to maximize what, what time I have with training. Um, I found that, yeah, compared to when I, thought that I would be able to fo fully focus on other things and I didn't do any training. It was probably the least productive time of, of my life because you just, yeah, it, it just, the, the ball wasn't rolling. I wasn't feeling good about things. You're sort of getting unhealthy. Um, that I think as pro athletes, we have conditioned our brain to just have a certain level of endorphins and, um, you know, it, it's just part of what our brains are conditioned to now. And so I, I sort of have realized now it's going to be a very slow wean off <laughs> of, of training. You know, cold turkey was definitely not the way to go. And I also love just lining up, still just love standing on a start line, ready to just go to war with other people, you know, in my own mind. And so, you know, I'm realistic now that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be chasing world titles or anything like that. But if I can jump on a start, you know, if I can put certain periods of time when my other athletes don't have aren't racing or this time opens up, I want to stay at a basic level of, you know, a decent base level of fitness that I could do. Oh, I'm going to do six weeks solid, hopefully get in shape for a top 10 in a race or, and then use that fitness to then go, Oh, I might try and do a half marathon. Well, or I might do a um, bike race. Well, um, and then just, you know, be able to jump off that sort of steady base training phase and, and jump into one individual sport specific event. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the other side of it, life's pretty short. I don't want to just keep doing triathlons the rest of my life. I think there's lots of other cool events out there that I want to try and do. And the nice part about jumping into, say, you know, bike racing or a swim race or is I'm never really going to be that competitive in a single sport event. Um, you know, potentially ultra running or something like that if I really dedicated to it. But even then, you know, you can't jump into a swim race and, be anywhere near people who've just been swimming their whole life and you can't jump into a bike race and expect to have the skills on descents that you know that cyclists have had you know that their whole career from just or being able to ride in a peloton so i like the idea of jumping into those races purely because i can't get that competitive <laughs> yeah that's sort of where i'm at and definitely the yeah the transition was hard but i feel like i'm in a good place now but it took a good year of sort of working out that you know you realize racing was largely your identity and working out who you are and what else you can do and um, mm. not, 
you know, not getting, not chasing it. <laughs> like it's hard to not go, oh, I could still win that race. And, you know, maybe you could, but it comes at a big cost every time you fully focus on something at a pro level. It's a big cost for the family and it's time for, you know, it's time to sort of pull back for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, it, it sounds like you've got it, uh, got it worked out pretty well there. And I, th- I think it's good to go through that, you know, go cold turkey and realize, oh, I feel like crap. I am, uh, I'm not getting anything, anything done. And that saying of, if you want something done, give it to a, a busy person. I find mm. that that's so true. If I'm, if I have no structure to my days, and I think about school holidays right now where uh, one of my kids is in school, the other one's not, but without that structure of, right, got to pick him up, drop him off at, at these times without these activities, I, I'm not getting that much done. I'm better if I've got this this structure. And they say you know, discipline is is freedom where, you know, if, if you've got these these things in the calendar and you, you stick to them, then you can, uh, you've got more control over those those times outside of it. And yeah, that's the, um, it's, it's, it's something that I've come to realize over the last couple of years as well as I, I hate, I hate being really busy where I've just got no, no free time in my calendar, but I also don't like the opposite because I just don't get anything, anything done. And then I look back at a, a few weeks and go, what, what was I doing? Like I was just, just wasting so much, much time. And for yeah. me, and I wonder, I wonder if you're the same, you talked about like, you've got that, you feel like you, you, you need to get these endorphins. You've got this desire to, um, you know, seek this feeling. I find each, really each day, I want to be doing at least kind of 30 minutes of aerobic work, preferably more if it's like 60 minutes, 90 minutes, then I'm, I'm pretty happy. And I just feel like every day I want to get that and I want to try and get it in the morning. It's, yep. it's just something that each day I'm addicted to in a way. Um, and if I don't get it, then I'm just, I'm not that happy. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit the same. I've sort of found my sweet spot to be around 90 minutes in the morning. Um, I'm sure over the years, hopefully that'll get less, <laughs> a little bit less, but <laughs> 90 minutes seems to be the the amount that, you know, I'm often just ready to go and cope with the day and feel happy. So, um, which sounds like a lot, but when you consider what, you know, you do as a pro triathlete where you, it's literally a small day is three hours. Um, so it's still a big step down and, I'm also pretty, I've been really surprised how well I can maintain fitness off 90 minutes a day, you know, for, um, you know, if you're eating well, not drinking too many beers and getting good sleep, it's actually, the decline has not been as fast as I would expect and um, sort of excites me because I feel like I could still jump into four to six weeks of solid training and, you know, still have fun in a race, not be totally embarrassed, embarrassing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's... um... And that, yeah, that's the, that, that's the thing that excites me too. It's, it's like I, uh, and racing some of these guys, even just on the, on the weekend where at, at Peter Pub, I didn't do the, the super fish, which is like the top 20 or 30, 30 guys there. I've got no chance against these guys who are training eight times a week doing minimum 40 K sometimes probably more up to like 80 K a week. It's like, I've got no chance against that. If I'm doing three to four sessions a week of like three K each, yeah. but it's it is it, it's still fun to sort of see okay what what can I do off off three or four sessions um, a week and and how can I adapt my training so I can get the most the most out of that time that I've got got available and that's what I've found quite enjoyable about diving into this sort of like zone zone two stuff and and trying to um, you know, sit sort of just below that that tipping point I've started to do some solo sessions where so like three by one k is the main set or. 15 twos and just on short rest, but just trying to find that, that sweet spot. And to me, I, like the, I, I love sitting in that, in that zone, in that range for a good period of time. And it's, and just the, the benefits, the, the aerobic benefits are, are huge. I'm really enjoying sort of getting, getting stuck into, into that. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny. I think um, for, you know, it's pretty well known that if that, that aerobic, easy aerobic training is just so, it's like a anxio, like it's an anti-anxiety medication in many ways. It just lowers your stress. And like, you know, I, I find it's, uh, it's just an important part for me to, to be able to function well in life. And um, certainly I found when I'm doing lots of high intensity, as much as I love it, I find I'm not, um, 
if, you can tell when you t you're doing too much of it because it affects everything else. You're, you're exhausted, you're grumpy. And I just find when you're getting that zone two work, right, you can just back it up day in, day out. And you start to get really fit because you're not, you're not having those days off. You're not have you don't have to have those days off. Sorry. You're not, uh, and you're not sort of, you know, once you're above that range, the, you know, obviously you, you cortisol production, your stress hormones are being produced. Um, and then, so then let's say you're not actually, you might feel good for an hour or two after the session when you've done like a real anaerobic set, but then three, four hours after the session, all of those nice feelings disappear and you've actually got more stress. And when you combine it with your life, family work. So, you know, if, if someone's out there and just wanting to stay fit and healthy, I'm not saying don't do the high intensity work, but if the key, if the, if you're using, um, exercise prim primarily as a stress release, it's really good to know where your zones are and, and make sure that you're staying below a certain point um, so that you can actually actually get some stress relief instead of actually contributing to it. Mm. And and going forward, so what have you got coming up that, that excites you, whether that's with the coaching, racing, personal, what are you what are you looking forward to over the next couple of years now that you've transitioned to this phase? Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, it's nice to just be able to look at things with the family and you know, in school holidays, it's planning certain things you can do. So, um, just, just being like, we haven't been able to go to the snow because I've always been overseas racing in June, July, you know, or, um, just, I just think my boys are really excited to just have a, not have that, a dad that's constantly traveling, not constantly tired. So, um, the family side of it, it's definitely been really beneficial. Um, that I look forward to just doing different things. I think from an athletic perspective, I just look forward to experiencing different races and jumping into different events, regardless of how competitive I am. So um, just experiencing more of life, I guess, is the is uh, from the racing side and family side. And then, um, yeah, from the, from a coaching perspective, I think, um, you know, I was talking to you earlier about, like, I we obviously do one-on-one -on -one coaching, but creating some other way people, you know, it's quite expensive to be coached by one of our coaches because we keep small numbers it's very personalized but i want to try and find a way we can open up the coaching to a bigger group even if it's not at a person like a fully personalized level just something to make people part of that community we're at a lot of races you know it's, it just makes it more fun if you can do it as a bit of a team so that's where my head's at sort of for the for the business side of things is looking for the next step for rpg um you know most of the coaches there are we're all pretty much at capacity. Everyone's doing a great job, obviously, because we don't have a high turnover of athletes. We focus on, um, you know, we, we really do focus on the quality of coaching. So, yeah, that's that's uh, the summary of, I guess, the goals across most of my life. Yeah, fantastic. And, and how old are your boys? So four, seven, and ten. Four, seven, ten. Yeah, right. Yeah. Awesome, In busy. Theater. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, school holidays has been um, it's been busy. <laughs> yeah, I bet. And uh, in terms of getting in, in, in touch with you, where, where's the best place to do that? So they can go to our website, rpgcoaching.com. Um, we're on Instagram too, um, at RPG Coaching, I'm pretty sure. Um, and just, yeah, there's contact details through there. Um, yeah, hit me up. Love to have you chat, let, have a chat and let you know what options there are. Um, and also we can keep you in the loop if when other, hopefully if we get another program going where it's more available to more people at a cheaper cost. So, um, yeah, reach out. Sounds good. Tim, I've really enjoyed this and it's been great to, to chat with you about uh, a lot of different things and, uh, yeah, love, love getting your perspective on, on, on swimming because I like to get it from, you know, I learn a lot from the guests that I, I have on and someone who coaches, age group triathletes and pros, and with the experience that you've had competing at the, the top level as well, great to get your insights on it. So thanks so much for being a guest and, uh, yeah, really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. No, good to chat. And, um, yeah, always I learn a lot from you. So thanks for thanks again for doing all your work. It's, uh, it's very helpful for us who don't have the energy to create such good videos. <laughs> <laughs> and, look, if, there, if there's any topics that keep coming up and I don't have a video, let me know because uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I try and do one a week, so there's no, no shortage of uh, capacity to do it as well. Yeah, Thanks, I'm, Tim. Thank you.